um, test there. This is uh, July 5th, 1998. It is indeed, and we're sitting out here in the deck of beautiful Port Townsend. And you are not Jesus Christ, as someone <laughs> said you were referred to. Yeah, well, I've been called a lot of things. <laughs> Bob just gave me that yeah. before I came over here. Nope. Yeah. Well, I'll let that pass. <laughs> John Pies, okay, former. Executive Director of the Pike Place Market. Uh, John, in 19, uh, well, before that, uh, when did you become a director of the market? Uh, I was trying to th think of that. I actually uh, followed George Rolfe. Uh, I went to work with George in 1974. Uh, there were three employees. He was the executive director. I was the property manager. And uh, I think uh, Val Thomas was the project director. And I became uh, executive director, I don't exactly remember when, four or five years later. <laughs> And then I left the market in 1983. So your span would be 79 to 83? No, 70. Well, in terms of being executive director, probably, as I say, I was a long time ago. I don't remember exactly uh, when I was with the PDA from uh, 74 to 83. So then you were there for all of the major repro uh, yes. uh, renovations. Yeah, we were the, the, and, uh, right. the other yeah, I was part of the group that uh, helped form the uh, PDA after the initiative passed. Mm -hmm. There was a volunteer group that got together and uh, tried to def determine what type of organization would be best suited to try to bring about the renovation and saving the market. Mm -hmm. And I never thought I'd be end up working for them. Uh, I actually was in the real estate business at the time and had a little office down there. Uh, then one thing led to another, and the possibility of getting involved as a property manager with George was uh, intriguing enough, and I was at a time in my life where it made some sense, so uh -huh. made the jump. Yeah. Did you do some of the, um, uh, well, the um, lease negotiations yes, some, I, to, to entice businesses back into the market? That was essentially my job. Uh -huh. I was the, uh, I had to handle all the leasing and was involved with that uh, until I became the director, at which time most of the major leases had all been, been worked out. And so, uh, yeah, that was kind of my expertise and, and the area that I devoted most of my time to. Mm -hmm. Some people still, who are lessees down that third level, still speak of you as a thing. Well, he, he said, I didn't have to come in until 10 o'clock. <laughs> well, the market's a fascinating place, as you know. Yeah. And there are so many different constituencies that uh, uh, it's hard to please all of them, and you very seldom do. And if you can please one, you're going to probably antagonize the other uh, 15 to 20. But yeah. um, we were, it was a very vulnerable time. The market was very, as you know, again, it was very close to extinction. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was a case of trying to figure out how do we entice the current merchants who are there to stay and work through this renovation period, which was going to be incredibly disruptive, mm -hmm. and at the same time attract other uh, merchants to come down to help uh, uh, bring the market back to, to flower. Yeah. And so it was an interesting, gentle dance that, that went on, and I found it fascinating. The outcome was never certain, was it? Absolutely not. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, it, it could have gone at any time, and it still can. I mean, it's uh, the one thing that you can't do, and I'm convinced of this, and no matter what your uh, endeavor is, is to maintain things in a static position. Yeah. Things are always going to change, and so the best you can do is try to guide the change into channels that, that make sense or that are, are productive to whatever your goals are. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think we were trying to do. And they said, you know, we made some mistakes. We uh, made, did some good things. Yeah. I know you don't have the documents or the paper here to remind you, but can you kind of generally outline what the financial structure was for the PDA in the renovations and getting money? Well, the, the, the PDA had nothing to start with. Um, and when the PDA was formed, the city, I believe, gave a, a startup grant of like $100,000. And this was essentially to... Uh, cover the initial costs of, of putting together a team to try to uh, make this thing work. Beyond that, we used almost every kind of financing in, uh, instrument that was known to man, at least at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, we looked for grants. We had uh, urban renewal grants. We had uh, low-income housing grants from HUD. Uh, we had uh, historic preservation, uh, I mean, low-income loans from HUD, not, mm -hmm. not grants, although there were some grants, I believe. Uh, we used uh, mortgages, conventional mortgages from banks. Um, 
anything that we could do to try to put that thing together. At that time, the financing was pretty favorable towards uh, urban renewal and renovation, and yeah. the feds were putting some monies out, so that kind of gave us the opportunity to at least get the thing started. You still had Warren Magnuson, too. That's right, and he was a great champion of the market uh, and did a lot to kind of open the doors to make things possible, but then we had to still justify what we were doing. And it was tough because we were using a model, an economic model, that. Um, is almost directly counter to what most uh, development models are. And so to try to convince people that, that this made sense uh, was a difficult uh, endeavor. Could you back that up? And a development model in the standard sense is... In the standard sense, the potential and that's right. In the standard sense, you're going to develop or redevelop a piece of property. You determine what your costs are. You determine uh, what uh, the economic return you need to make this possible. You come up with equity capital to uh, make a uh, cover a gap, and you work with the bank or some other lender to put it together. Mm -hmm. uh, in this, we started at the opposite end and said, we're going to determine what the rents are, uh, which is your income stream, yeah. and then work backwards from that and say, OK, now how much is it going to cost to do this? and then figure out well how much of a gap there was to be able to renovate the market and maintain the rent structure that we had predetermined was an appropriate rent structure for that particular area. And so this is really cockeyed. I mean, this is not standard uh, free enterprise uh, uh, development, but it was the only way we felt that we could preserve the type of rent structure that made it possible for the market uh, as a collection of small businesses generally underfinanced, mm -hmm. not necessarily very, very sophisticated, give them a chance to survive because mm -hmm. um, it was tough. Yeah. And the, the businesses that were still there when the PDA came in in 74, a lot of them were hanging on by their teeth mm -hmm. and were real mom and pop and, and close to going out. So it was trying to nurture those people and, and the one thing we could control if we were successful enough in our financing was the rents that would be charged mm -hmm. and so that's the way we set it and then we tried to make sure that we attracted the types of people or types of businesses that uh, fit into the overall market pattern. We weren't looking for Safeways and uh, Starbucks and no. people like that. In fact we went out of our way to keep them out of there. Starbucks you didn't take No, well, Starbucks started there, <laughs> but they started with three guys. <laughs> they were not <laughs> the Starbucks as we know it now. So <laughs> it was a different operation. And again, a, a real market success story. Because yeah. yeah. we tried to be a, a kind of a breeding ground for uh, new businesses to uh, nurture people trying to get going with an idea who didn't necessarily fit the usual profile of yeah. sophisticated business with good financing and good management yeah. skills. Well, some of those guides were in the historical commission guidelines about owner-operated business styles of operation. Right. And uh, not multiple stores. And stores. Right. And that, that really benefited, I think. I think it helped uh, try to maintain that, that ambience yeah. that uh, people seemed to associate with the market and, and saw it as something that they were really related to. At some time, the money stream got tight and you were well, looking at some buildings that weren't finished and absolutely. didn't have the money to do it. What, uh, and Eventually, the, um, was that year when that new tax was uh, devised selling the tax credits? Oh, I don't know. Actually, the, the uh, enabling legislation, or the, actually it was a, a tax ruling by IRS, uh, had been in effect for a bit of time. And what this was, essentially, it was a means whereby uh, a organization could uh, could capitalize on the depreciation value of the property. The PDA, as a nonprofit organization, owned a whole lot of property in the in the market, a lot of buildings. Uh, in the normal course of events, if they had been owned in the uh, private manner, there would be depreciation, uh, a substantial depreciation that could be used for uh, reducing one's taxes. Being a nonprofit. That value, that uh, that tax benefit, had absolutely no value to the PDA. There was nothing we could do to take advantage of it. However, there are or were investment groups or investors who were in high tax brackets who needed tax write-off and and could actually assign a value. They'd say, "Well, if you can give me a hundred thousand dollars of tax write-off a year for five years, mm -hmm. that's worth X yeah. to me." 
So in our scrambling to try to find means of completing the market, we had by that time I think had uh, essentially completed the core market, but we were still trying to figure out how to do the, uh, the sanitary market and uh, a few of the other market buildings. Um, and as you say, the other funds, the grant funds particularly, were running out. Mm -hmm. Uh, it seemed like an opportunity that w we certainly sh uh, needed to pursue, um, and we did. Do you remember what year that was? No, no. I don't. You were, you were executive director when that? Yes. Uh, when the first part of it came together, yeah, I was, I was the director when uh, we got the first monies from the uh, urban group people. Uh, then after I left, there was an additional syndication done, I think, with the core market, and I sort of lost track of well, it all. I should apologize, too. I haven't done all my homework. I'm not <laughs> I can go back and pick up those dates. Yeah, I'm just, I, it's been so long, I just don't, yeah. don't re yeah. recall uh, what, what I wanted, I really wanted to get was uh, kind of the connection, because I'll be talking to Artie and Marty later this week. Yeah. I'm going back to New York and, and who made the first approach? Who found whom? Or was there a broker? There was sort of a broker, although he didn't function as a, as a broker. Uh, I mean, in terms of, of taking commissions that I'm aware of, we didn't never paid anyone any commission that I know of. Uh, Paul, somebody, uh, <laughs> who's uh, Artie and Marty will be sure and tell you. He had he was out in Seattle doing a some kind of a, a seminar or workshop with the um, Department of Community Development for, uh, for Seattle, their division that uh, was involved with the market. I think at that time, I think maybe Harriet was uh, chair, I'm not positive, uh, of, the, uh, mm -hmm. of that, that branch. Uh, mm -hmm. And I'm not exactly sure what he was doing other than giving ideas to the city officials as to what different types of financing and so forth were. And, in the process, we got to, to meet him and talk to him and uh, uh, were explaining our concerns or our, our situation. He became quite aware of what was happening in the market. Uh -huh. and, and so the idea of looking into the syndication of the depreciation values of the properties that we own came up and we, they, we said, pursue it. Good idea everybody. Well, yeah. I mean, why not uh, look into it? And mm -hmm. so he made contact. He said he had contacts in the East, uh, and which he did. Mm -hmm. And I guess he talked to... I don't know how many different people, but a fair number, and Artie and Marty are the ones that ended up coming out. Well, they bought other properties in Seattle. I don't, I'll have to find out whether they bought, they, they, they picked up an interest in the Bush Hotel and Broadway Market and some other location. Maybe, again, I don't know whether that was at the same time, before, or after. Yeah, uh, I my sense is, and this is just a, a gut feeling, I have absolutely nothing to, to prove it one way or another, is that, that the market was kind of their first step into uh, the Pacific Northwest. Mm -hmm. Could have been, yeah. yeah. Well, so a deal was struck on, on I don't know, which, what was the first building, do you recall? Uh, uh, I think it was the sanitary market. Uh, there, were, there were a couple of properties that were involved. As far as we worked in, uh, when I was there, it was kind of like one package, mm -hmm. and there were a, a few properties that were, mm -hmm. were involved in that package, and I believe it was the Saturday market, it might have been the economy market. Uh, yeah, my memory, <laughs> you, you check this out with the, the various parties. The last one to be worked on in a yeah. major way. So, so it may very well have been the yeah. economy market, not the sanitary but market. There were, I think, three different. Well, there was, so there was whatever the, the one. must have come back and done one. Yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah, I think after, yeah, after I left, then they, then they got involved more in the core market, uh, mm -hmm. but I, again, I'm not sure which buildings. Yeah. So I don't, uh, I don't trust my recollection that well of exactly what properties were involved. Well, I want to hold it in there. No, it wasn't the economy market. I don't think it was. I think it was the, yeah, yeah. You, you, you can check that out. Uh, well, in the course of this one, which we don't have to finish it until I guess October is our deadline, we'll, we'll talk to every one of the executive directors, mm -hmm. find George and yeah. sit downtown and get right up to Shelley. So, uh, so that sequence will be mm -hmm. fitted out, but there it, it was a, they said, this is a good thing, let's go back and do it, do it again. No. <laughs> and, and it must, Marty and Marty must have liked it, because they, I know they picked up the Bush Hotel and the Broadway Market, which probably through contact with Val Thomas. Um, Could be, I don't know. Yeah. Um, so, with that money, which mm -hmm. looked like a good deal, you were able to finish those, those mm -hmm. projects, and this was coming to about the end of your term then. Right. Uh -huh. 
And that also was just about the final completing of the uh, renting and leasing of space. Everybody was full up. The yeah. prices came down. And right. Now, that, that essentially was it. And yeah. uh, in fact, that was one of the kind of the prime reason why I left. The, the job had evolved into primarily a property management uh, yeah. position, which uh -huh. was interesting, but after 10 years was uh, not that interesting. <laughs> the fun and the interest, uh, I found uh, a lot of it was in trying to put together the pieces of, of how you renovate a market when you don't have yeah. uh, a lot of capital and when you're dealing with uh, tenants who probably wouldn't pass muster with most uh, banking uh, <laughs> <laughs> deals. And, and that was fun and challenging, so yeah, I enjoyed that. And after all, in 10 years, it was time to move on anyhow, yeah. give somebody else a, a, an opportunity. Yeah. And so you had to uh, come over here to, to Fort Townsend. Oh, yeah. I love this place. Yeah. This is great. Uh, can you trip your memory now or switch it to uh, your dealings with Paul Crabble when he was on the city council? Oh. The, uh, the efforts to, to uh, change the management of the day tables and, and that? Or was that a That's... That's a kind of a, I, my recollections and all of that are, are not as, quite as, as clear as on this other. Uh, the day table management had been an issue from the get-go. Uh, the PDA and the Historic Commission were absolutely clear, as well as the city, in what the priorities had to be. This was a farmer's market. The great big sign, meet the producer, didn't mean meet the wholesaler. Yeah. Uh, and yet uh, there were a lot of people who, had kind of hung in and helped the market continue. A lot of craftspeople and and buyers of goods who were just reselling them on the day tables when the day tables uh, were practically all vacant. So uh, the priorities were being maintained, but as the market became more successful in the renovation period, there was obviously more pressure for the tables. It became a good place to sell. Mm -hmm. uh, our concern was that the farmers were being whittled down, not by the craftspeople, but by the economics of, of small-time farming um, and the competition of supermarkets and the like. I mean, the market, uh, people's shopping habits had differed, so or had changed and had evolved. And so we, we recognized the significance and the importance of the, what we call the craftspeople. And again, th this is a bit of a misnomer. Uh, there are a lot of people who, and particularly the new ones that came in, who have to, as you know, being a, the former director of the uh, Merchants Association, have to uh, prove that they are making their own items. Yeah. But there were a fair number of people who were not, and they got kind of grandfathered in. Yeah. And they tended to be the most successful. Mm -hmm. uh, they began, and so did some of the new crafts, you'll feel the pinch as there was a limited amount of space and it became a much better place to sell. So there had been a lot of controversy and a lot of uh, dissatisfaction between the uh, various contingencies, and, yeah. and the street musicians were also part of this. Mm -hmm. The, I think the main impetus of the so-called Hilt Amendment was to try to formalize the uh, operating procedures that the PDA had been using relative to not just the farmers but to the craftspeople as well. I think there was a, a strong feeling amongst many of the craftspeople that they were just hanging out there and they were vulnerable and that any time the PDA uh, or the Historic Commission or the City of Seattle, although the city wasn't that involved, uh, decided they basically could be cut loose. And so they were looking for something that gave them a more definitive uh, position within the market hierarchy. Control their livelihood. Which is yeah, right. And there were some who resented the fact that farmers were given more space and were given priority. But mm -hmm. most of the people, the craftspeople, understood that without the farmers, there probably wouldn't be a market. Yeah. Had the market lost all the farmers in 72 or in 74, uh, I doubt that the market could have been renovated. Yes. The, mar the farmers were the symbol mm -hmm. of the market, and we had to discover ways to make it vi uh, viable for them to continue operating there, and it was tough. Yeah. The farmlands were being swallowed up. How do you tell a farmer to, to turn down $100,000 an acre for his land when he can make yeah. uh, you know 3000 an acre off of it? It's pretty hard. And so the PDA struck out and, and hired uh, a person to help coordinate with the farmers. We did education. We worked with the King County on the uh, the initiative or the program to buy farmland and preserve it. Yeah. 
And so the farmers st are still that significant, but there are still a lot of the craftspeople, I think, who felt that, that they were uh, they were being treated as second-class yeah. citizens. And I think that's what the Hilt Amendment was basically trying to address, was saying, okay, let's try to formalize this a little better so that uh, there's a little more certainty for the craftspeople, but not, and this was, it was the key element I remember, but not at the expense of the farmers. What was the, uh, what was your sense of the city council's interest in this issue during that time? Oh, I think the city council wasn't particularly interested. Uh, in fact, we had to kind of try to get the city council yeah. interested. Uh, I mean, this is, the, the market, unless you're involved in it on a pretty much a day-to-day -day basis, can be a real pain in the ass. And uh, uh, there are lots of people who were hounding council members, and uh, I mean, and they could be, uh, generally not the farmers. The farmers weren't very well organized, and they realized that they were pretty well protected. But craftspeople, musicians, other merchants, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, and so I think the most of the city council felt that they had more important things to deal with than trying to settle the petty politics of the Pike Place market. Yeah. Although whenever an election came up, every single politician in the city of Seattle shows up at the Pike Place market. Yeah, <laughs> they still do. Yeah. It's the soul of Seattle, yeah. uh, and I think there's some merit. There's some merit to that, uh, and and yeah. so. Yeah. But the trying to the people who are really primarily interested were uh, Paul and Michael. And then Sam got uh, involved, Sam Smith got involved once, um, I forget what his issue was. I think, I'm not sure if it was around the Hilt Amendment, or it may have been, uh, but he, you know, Sam would come up periodically. That's a and populist he, issue that he would Yeah, yeah and, he, and he'd get, in, get involved in it. I, uh, we have a different city council now, and the issue is a little bit different now. Um, hmm. Well, that's just about all that I can think okay. of. Okay. Final. <laughs> no, I just, you know, the market is, uh, I carry very fond memories of the Pike Place market. It was a challenging, fascinating, exciting place to be. I loved it. Uh, I got out when I, when I should. Rather than being kicked out, I left, uh, and I, not that I was going to be kicked out that I'm aware of, you know. but uh, it was a great phase of my life, and I thoroughly enjoyed it, and I still have a lot of good friends who are merchants there, and I... I send people to the market all the time. A lot of people still remember you there, too. Yeah. I'm going to take a look at what you had to give the market up for here. Well, if it were a clear day, you'd be looking right at Mount Baker. Ah. And, but you're missing it in the whole Cascades and then down to the South Mount Rainier. But you got to come back on a sunny day. Well, that's what they all say. <laughs> I went to three ball games out at uh, the new baseball stadium at the University of uh, Washington. Uh -huh. and Mount Rainier is supposed to be right in the, right. In the center field. <laughs> yeah, exactly. well, mm -hmm. You know, I know. I lived there 30 years, so I know it doesn't look, but three games. I never did. You say, where is this mountain? Nice thing this there. mountain you're talking about? Yeah. 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 So that's formerly Mount Baker. I'll pray on that. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs>
they've, they've worked really hard on... I mean, it was pretty upsetting to go through the farm tables and see no flowers, food. Flowers, flowers. Yeah, I mean, has anyone ever suggested not allowing <laughs> oh, people God, to sell flowers right? unless there's 50% food or something like that? Uh -huh. Has this been this huge battle? Uh -huh. Did you go through to the crafts people and tell them not to sell t-shirts unless they got 50% jewelry? <laughs> You know, I mean, I, I've always argued for banning it. people to, to cut their income in half to make it look like Martha Stewart's market. And that's, that's a pretty hard question. No, I, I totally disagree. I don't think it's, it's how it looks. I think it's who so it serves. This, this particular well, year is a Hilt Amendment. Um, or Hilt I know. Amendment I, I, renewal, yeah, yeah. And the whole proposal that the PDA put up was, okay, if you are selling um, fresh produce, you can have a third table. And, um, but they screwed up, you know, didn't leave enough time for public comment, blah, blah, blah. <coughs> so it's sitting in the lap of the city council right now, whether or not they're even going to, um, you know, whether they're going to. Yeah. I would abolish the health amendment. Well, <laughs> <laughs> see, I, I, actually, it's, it's so interesting to go to the, every time I've ever been to any session in any conference like this, everybody is talking like, crafts people kill markets. It's true. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm really shocked at how much less of a fresh food market Pike Place is just in the, and since I've been gone. I mean, yeah. it's really noticeable. It's very, very, very noticeable. Were you here on Wednesday? Uh -uh. You weren't. There. Well, I mean, I got here Wednesday night. It's organic, um, organic uh -huh. day, and the street is all organic for the farmers. And totally food that day. We're, so it's Wednesdays and Sundays. I'm not so part of this conference, day. but I have a different opinion from Shelley than probably the last week. And then we'll get rid of you. All right. Okay. Well, give me, let's do this interview. Let's get it all in now. <laughs> but, um, when we remember the black and white pictures of the market in the 30s with the pickup trucks and all the farmers that you yeah. the standard grocery store was 25 feet wide and was about 100 yards from people's homes. Right. It was all over the neighborhood. Completely marketing, different marketing sure. world at that time. Now we're in the 1990s, you've got a completely different marketing world. So don't blame the farmers for selling their, their highest value product, which is flowers. Well, but it, when the marketing of the market could, could bring in... What I'm, what I'm saying is that the, the whole thrust of the market... I mean, I mean, we did a planning study in the mid-'80s called the Agenda for the 80s, and the question that was posited then was, you know, in all your management decisions, you need to make a choice between whether this is going to be a great local market serving local needs and reflecting local culture or whether you want to become a regional and national attraction. And, you know, I guess I felt very strongly that it needed to be the one, and I feel like it's really become the other. I mean, you know. They didn't make a clear cut decision. That yeah, they did, ma they did make a clear-cut decision. It was actually adopted, and they made a clear-cut decision, but pretty much every single decision that's been made over the last at least eight or nine years yeah. has gone the other way. Yeah, right. I mean, you know, Johnny Yokoyama's selling fish. I mean... It's uh, theatrical fish. Right? Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, the symbol of the market is, you know, flying fish. I mean, there's, you know, there's and ten no, people taking pictures for every, for every person buying a fish, mm -hmm. and it's a show. It's a, you know, it's a Disney thing. I mean, it's more, it's moving more toward, a fe you know, the reason why festival markets fail, which is that it's not real. You know, it's a, it, it's a show, and people ultimately see through that. Yeah. I just looked at the flip flops of uh, market, historic market, too, in Charleston, this, this early this month. Horrible market. Nothing. Yeah, it's dead. I mean, Charleston all. market. Absolutely yeah. nothing but trash. Yeah, but Char Charleston's a great example. You know, I mean, that's, that's the ultimate outcome of wh where the market is edging toward. And the market is still wonderful and great, and I love it. But that's the direction it's been heading. Oh, yeah, no, you're a long way from that. Charleston is just all tchotchkes and tourist crap. And but you know what happens there's every the, time. There's nothing real about it. Like, like about two years ago, the PDA Council decided that, um, that maybe Flower Row should go back to having flowers on it or at least have businesses that were going to um, yeah. be doing something besides T-shirts. And, and every time it happens, there's a the vested interest screaming, constituency screaming, that's screaming, yelling and screaming. They and they Well, and but they, they shouldn't back off. Well, of <laughs> I mean, course that's, that's the problem. True, but, but they do. You know, they're, they're volunteers who just don't have the backbone for... Yeah, but I mean, you know, the issue is, who, you know, I mean, the, the issue is who you're serving. You're serving the merchants or you're serving, the, you know, the, the customers and the community. And, you know, it's always, 
I mean, that's always been a struggle, mm -hmm. you know, and has always been one of my main differences with the leadership. Anyway. Let's talk about the early, um, uh, how you came to the market. Sure. That's an important thing. Introduce him, get, find out who he is. Good. And then ask him about those urban group uh, lead-up questions. Mm -hmm. And then we'll get to the medical school. Well, the, the how I came to the market is more related to so what I've been saying has been typed. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> oh, I'm in big trouble. <laughs> um, the how I came to the market is more related to um, the agencies. I mean, the, you know, the urban group stuff came long, long afterwards. But anyway, I'll do it any way you want. How you came to the market, and um, well, talk about your early job dealing with bringing more farmers to the market too. Well, that actually wasn't my my early job. I mean, I, I had spent about a year and a quarter traveling in Europe, basically visiting dozens of markets in Europe and Eastern Europe and North Africa. And I applied for a job to try and get more farmers coming to the market. The uh, last farm in the market film had just been made, and the number of farmers had dwindled from 660 to 40, and it was declining every year. What year was it? And 1977, April 1977. And I just moved up to Seattle and applied for a job as farmer liaison and um, was offered the job and went back and thought about it and decided that I really didn't want to take it because I didn't like the way the market's redevelopment was going. I felt like there was a tremendous amount of attention to turning what was very much a real place that was serving kind of a diverse audience in a, what was essentially a low-income neighborhood into a very sanitized, much more disnified, much more upscale market that ignored the community that really surrounded it and that had sustained it since 1907. And um, I remember going back and filling up about 15 legal size yellow pages of sort of notes about what I thought they should be doing. Mm -hmm. And I went back and talked to George Rolfe, who was executive director of the PDA at the time, basically telling him that I really didn't want, you know, thanking him for offering me the job as former liaison, but saying that I didn't want to accept it because um, I really didn't feel comfortable about the direction the PDA and the city was moving in transforming the market. And he said, well, what do you mean? And I sort of started talking about gentrification and started talking about the changes that I was seeing uh, in terms of the impact um, of the market and suggested that, you know, one of the important priorities for the market should be creating a sense of community um, and joining with the primarily low-income elderly people who live in and around the market and committing to maintaining and expanding the amount of low-income housing, uh, you know, before they added market rate and upscale housing to that and, and creating an infrastructure of human services that provided for a healthy community and that really would sustain that community in a way that was healthy rather than continuing continuing to marginalize those people and moving in a direction which would tend to move those people out and convert the housing that did exist into um, upscale yuppie housing. Mm -hmm. And I talked about creating a number of community institutions as a way to accomplish that and mentioned the senior center and health clinic and um, child care center. I think we didn't, we didn't really talk about a food bank at that point. Um, and I'd been involved in Madison and helping to develop some, um, there was a Blue Bus medical clinic that I was involved in and some community activities there. And basically I was told that, you know, he was disappointed that I was turning down the job but was kind of interested in what I had to say. And if I could raise my own salary, um, he would, um, he, George Rolfe, would give me a desk to sit at and a place to do my work. So I thanked him and That's went sweet. home and thought about it and called him up and said, yeah, I think I'll do that. And went and wrote myself a CETA grant mm -hmm. 
and uh, got paid that way. And basically, first I guess started talking with a lot of the people in the community, both the low-income elderly residents, people like Del Mock and Doris Lockwood, um, and also some of the other folks um, in the community who were working with with that population, uh, people at, at Plymouth Congregational Church, mm -hmm. Reverend Caldwell, and there was something called the Millionaires Club. Mm -hmm. um, forget the name of the green something. Um, and just kind of talked about building a sense of community and building uh, a, a place that everybody could feel a part of and everybody could have a sense of ownership in. And I remember talking, going and talking to um, Harriet Sherburn, who at that point was head of the city arm, uh, which was still very much involved in the redevelopment of the market. And Harriet um, said, oh, we, we've tried all those ideas. That's preposterous. That's impossible. That would that would never work. There's no there's no funding for that. And you know that's you know not at all what we should be doing. And I sort of thanked her for her help and her support and her interest, and walked off and basically found some people um, in the city who were sympathetic and did have a sense uh, of that, and started connecting up with some people who were um, interested and started basically bringing on volunteers uh, who were very helpful and very key in you know getting the work done and in, in moving the ideas and the, uh, the whole issues of creating that network of services and creating uh, a philosophy and a base for community that could happen. And uh, me, Alexander, Marla Sarikson, um, who were some of the others, Allison, mm -hmm. um, were, were VISTA volunteers who really, you know, got paid essentially nothing and who were, you know, worked very hard in helping make that possible. Um, at some point, um, through that process, hooked up with um, Chris Hurley, who had um, recently graduated from school in uh, health administration, and talked to her about the idea of a community clinic, and Chris was incredibly excited and receptive and, you know, made it very clear that she not only supported the idea, but really wanted to get involved and, and wanted to um, help play a key role in making that happen. And I remember um, when we were doing the community development block grant applications for funding for both the senior center and, and the clinic, and um, uh, Chris was very involved in that. And one of the things that we were doing was um, trying to get, there was a program called the National Health Service Corps. Um, and uh, we were trying to get a commitment from the National Health Service Corps to bring federally funded doctors into the downtown. And we made application and they turned us down because you had to be in an underserved area to get National Health Service Corps docs down here. And they said, oh, you know, the downtown is the concentration of doctors. There's millions of doctors downtown. There's no way this is a medically underserved area. So we um, got Doris Lockwood and a couple of other seniors to get on the phone and try and make an appointment uh, with a doctor downtown saying that they were a Medicare um, patient. And of course, nobody would see them um, because they, they, weren't, they didn't have private insurance um, and basically were able to successfully make a case. Uh, I don't think we ever got National Health Service Corps doc, but I, I think we were clearly from that were able to demonstrate the fact that people were not being served and that, you know, being on Medicaid or Medicare was not sufficient to guarantee that you would have access to decent medical care. Um, and it was really George Rolfe who first, uh, I remember George sort of saying, well, I've got some idea of where, where this might go. Let's go look at it. And I remember looking at the clinic and senior center space and really being able to envision that. And I think it was important to me that they were next to each other because, you know, what I envisioned was 
something that was much more interactive perhaps than has already happened where there would be kind of two bookends of a community center for older people that would take care of both their health and, and social needs and I think it's unfortunate that that, that hasn't happened more more than it has um, and I remember when we were designing the um, clinic and the senior center um, we were working with a group called Environmental Works uh, up on Capitol Hill, and there was a new architect named Anne, I forget her last name, um, who had recently graduated from, uh, you know, architecture school and interior design, um, Anne Fisher, I think. And, um, you know, we both sat down and said, you know, this is not going to be one of those clinics where it's... Uh, uh, going to be institutional green and gray. You know, we want people to come in and feel vibrant and exciting, and we want to capture the spirit and movement of people who, um, uh, you know, that live in this neighborhood. So when we were specking the colors for the clinic, um, we spec colors like uh, plum and tangerine and very, you know, sort of vibrant, uh, exciting colors and I remember going in after the uh, final paint had been applied and really sort of wanting to throw up because it was just so god awful. I mean it was so hideous to see these, you know, enormous walls of um, you know, plum and tangerine. And I went back and uh, talked to George Rolfe and said, Oh God, I really screwed up, you know, this is just horrible and George who was very sweet and very supportive, and I really credit and, and sort of giving me a kind of a free hand and doing doing some of the original organizing work. George said to me, you know, paint's cheap, don't worry about it, you know, we can paint it over, but, you know, the one lesson that I would hope you would take away from this is that, you know, God had a very good reason for making elephants gray and canaries yellow. You know? <laughs> I've never, never sort of forgotten that. But long before the... Um, uh, clinic and the senior center were were being built. It was clear that in order to get the block grant funding and go through Davis Bacon and go through all of the various requirements for getting it built, that it was going to take about a year and a half or two years. And people didn't want to wait. You know, there was a group of perhaps twenty or twenty-five volunteers, mostly low-income elderly people who lived in the market who were really excited by the idea and who had been involved very much in, in the questionnaires, in the demographic analysis that we did, in the various studies and groundwork that was done that was necessary to make that happen. And, you know, people were not, you know, felt like there was a need for it now, didn't want to wait, and... Um, and well, you know, we, we went and... and you know, I went to George and said, look, you know, we, isn't there some kind of space that we can move into before, you know, while all this other bureaucracy is working its way through the, uh, through the system? And we, w we went and looked at the Motherlode Tavern. The Motherlode had been, you know, the Hells Angels bar in town and was really literally covered by inches of grime and stale vomit and urine and was really kind of a god-awful... Um, place and um, George said you want to you want to use this space <laughs> and I said and you know we went and talked and you know we were all you know would have these meetings and people said yeah you know we can turn this into something and um, so we were given the right to go ahead and sort of take over the mother load as a place where the senior center and the clinic could happen and and you know dozens of people pitched in and cleaned and scraped and washed and scrubbed and fixed and I remember being there um, when we hit pay dirt so to speak it was like getting through the inches of grime on on the floor and getting down to the bottom of the floor and realizing that there was this incredibly beautiful lapis lazuli mm -hmm. blue tile uh, on the floor and similarly on, on the ceiling, you know, you know, after getting through all the various le levels of grunge, you know, finding out that there was this pressed tin roof and that the space was actually quite, quite beautiful and, and um, you know, and really started there with 
volunteer docs and volunteer staff and I think Joe Martin got involved, was really part of that whole volunteer cadre along with Chris Hurley uh, from the start and um, you know, the people in the community who, who were just very committed to seeing it happen and I, and I think the fact that people had a struggle to build it on their own really gave it, a, you know, imbued it with a sense of spirit and passion that uh, never would have happened if it had simply been handed to people uh, on a platter, you know, planned by some, you know, bureaucrat. Um, and I, you know, I'm, does Marlos have a question? No, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so he's covered every question I was going to ask. <laughs> <laughs> what else do you need? I wanted you to do the mother load. I wanted you to do block grant. I wanted you to do the current spaces and all that sort of stuff. So, um, so that's good. Um, so why don't you fast forward? Fast forward three or, three or four years to 1981 and and talk about sure. um, the urban group and, and what it was like in the beginning? Well, I mean, the background to the urban group was that, you know, the decision had just been made to um, uh, redo this, rehab the Stewart House mm -hmm. and uh, as SRO housing and to maintain at least half of the Stewart House as, as a wood frame building, and which was, of course, very, very heavily fought. And, you know, Victor Steinberg was just very adamant about really preserving it and keeping um, keeping it as an example of, of the kind of wood frame SRO um, units. It was a big struggle around that. And the decision was finally... Yeah, it was... It down and all that stuff. Right. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you need to put yourself back in the, you know, late 70s, early 80s when Senator Magnuson was head of the Senate Finance mm -hmm. Committee and Jerry Johnson was his aide, then, you know, if you had, you know, if you, d you made a decision that you needed, you know, to redo the Stewart House, then you called up Jerry and said, you know, we need another $4 million, and, you know, Senator Magnuson would pencil it into some Senate appropriations bill, and a few weeks later, there, you know, a check for $4 million would appear. Um, it was very simple. Slight exaggeration, but... <laughs> it was not that much of an exaggeration. It really was not. Um, uh, you know, I mean, you know, the, the tens of millions of dollars that went into the market's redevelopment, I would bet that a very high percentage of that was, um, were, were written in as appropriation grants. They were not, you know, competitive grants. They were not, and, you know, Magnuson was a brilliant politician who really did a great deal in uh, benefiting. I mean, I think it was a good use of federal dollars. I don't, I, I don't question it. Related appropriations right. also, oh, yeah. Which is why oh, yeah. accountants really cannot determine how much federal money came in. Mm -hmm. so right. Right. We know well, how much was commenting on, oh, two or three weeks later, a big check would come. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, you know, maybe it was months later or whatever, but it, I mean, it just, it was not, you know, I mean, when I think about what it takes to do fundraising for major economic development projects now and, and how competitive and how, you know, how much of a struggle and all the 450-page applications, and it just wasn't like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it really was a much more informal process and really rested on the political power of uh, one man, um, Senator Magnuson, as, you know, sort of expressed and... Uh, you know, carried out through uh, through Jerry Jerry's offices, um, who was at that time Magnuson's administrative assistant. Anyway, then Ronald Reagan was elected, and I remember I was um, right before the election. I had been working on a uh, an EDA grant, Economic Development Administration grant to expand the bulk commodities exchange and do a community cannery and a variety of projects to really beef up the ability for farmers to do value-added products and sort of solidify, you know, the farmer's position in the market. And I remember watching with some horror um, Reagan's initial inaugural speech mm -hmm. when he threw out the line, among other horrific lines about, you know, and we're going to eliminate the Economic Development Administration, uh, you know, which we had we already been gotten. awarded the money, right? Yeah, we had already been yeah. awarded the money and had been working on it for, for, for years. And we got a letter, of course, the next day, you know, canceling the grant and withdrawing the grant. And it was really a wholesale 
withdrawal of federal support for any kind of community-based or economic development-based project that wasn't benefiting multinational corporations. And there was, it wasn't that the money was being withdrawn, it was being redirected toward large corporations uh, and, you know, political supporters and contributors to uh, the Republican Party as opposed to toward minority folks and low-income people and elderly people. Um, and if, I rec if my recollection is right, we still had not nailed down all of the money for the Stewart House. Um, and it was clear, I mean, the market's renovation was still very much in, um, in progress. It was not by any means completed. And um, there was a commitment to um, build, to maintain at least 350 units of um, low-income elderly housing, which had been a goal in the urban renewal plan that we had actually, um, I and some of the um, low-income elderly residents had approached uh, legal services about suing the city to maintain that goal. And I remember, um, uh, which initially the city was very hostile to, and when Charlie Royer was elected, um, he was very sympathetic to and was very aware that the actual impetus for that was coming, you know, that, that I as a PDA employee was involved in that and we were sort of scheming behind the scenes mm -hmm. and I think Daryl Grothaus was, mm -hmm. um, head of community development at that time. But anyway, we're, that's a, mm -hmm. that's, a, nice that's a, story. another story for another day. Um, but we were, um, you know, it was clear that there was not going to be sufficient money to finish the Stewart House and to finish the renovation of the market. It was also and the sanitary, right? Wasn't it half done or something? No, I think the sanitary okay. had, had already been completed. Um, and, um, you know, there was a shortfall of several million dollars. And John Finke went to the then head of the uh, PDA, Harris Hoffman, with this scheme of selling the tax credits and it was John proposed. Then, I think, wasn't it? I'm sorry? John was still here then. It was, it, yeah, I think. I, second set. Yeah, I think John. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. I think that's right. I think it was John. Um, John Kleiss. And I don't. I don't really remember a lot about the first. I, mean, I do remember that it was John Finke who sort of brought Arthur Melnbud and Marty Majors um, to the PDA. And I really got involved when Harris was executive director um, in terms of, I mean, I mean, the initial syndications that were done with John Kleist were, were fairly small and really didn't involve the bulk of the market. Uh, I, I think they just involved perhaps one, one or two buildings. But it was really um, under Harris that the proposal to really, um, in effect, sell and lease back the the bulk of the market was. And um, I met Marty Majors and Arthur Malmud and really thought that they were scum, and you know did not trust them and did not um, you know I mean, counseled Harris that this was a mistake and that it didn't you know that there were other places to get the money or that, you know, I did not feel like they, that it, it, it was a wise decision yeah. to, um, to move forward with that. And what Harris asked me to do was, you know, given that opposition to get involved in helping to read the documents and help make the, the documents as strong as they could be um, to try and protect the, the, um, the market's interest in doing that. And I, and, and I agreed to do that. Um, and you know, in some ways, I think I'm sorry that that I did. I wish I had voiced my opposition more publicly or more loudly. And you know, hindsight is always easier than foresight. But you know, did suggest adding some language like having the friends of the market um, have to approve the removal of the PDA as manager and some other things that I think were helpful in, in the in the final. Uh, outcome of the um, uh, of the battle uh, with the urban group, but the you know the way that it unfolded was actually when um, you know there was what was supposed to have been a pro forma 
um, approval of, of leases um, to show the IRS that, you know, the Marty Majors and Malmud, you know, really did have some incidents of ownership and uh, were involved in the actual management of, uh, of the market, but it, but it really was um, represented by our council um, as being a sham and would never happen and could never happen. And then we were, uh, one of the projects that I was working on was trying to expand the child care center. And we, you know, went along and found them new space and signed a lease with them and then sent it off for approval and got back a no, that they weren't going to approve the uh, the new lease with the child care center, that they wanted to... Yeah. I, I don't remember. I don't remember the exact dates, but it was it was clearly at the end of the '80s. Um, and you know, clearly, what they were trying to do was something that we had always been assured they never could do, uh, which was to get involved in the actual management and and day-to-day -day operations um, of the market. And um, you know, there there was you know, I mean, I just remember time and time again being reassured both by our attorneys and by Harris and by Majors and Malmud themselves that there was no way that basically what happened could happen. That that was never, not only the intent, but that it was legally impossible that the documents were drawn in such a way and that, you know, they would have to get the approval of the Friends of the Market and, you know, every other, you know, the Historic Commission, every other group in the Sun to try and exercise the kind of control that they in fact did. Um, try and exercise. And um, you know, it was really horrific. I mean, it was a horrific um, experience to sort of see what had been my worst nightmare going into it coming to pass. It was very painful. So what was it about um, Art and Marty in the first place that led you to your opinion about them? They were slimy liars. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, uh, you know, they were both kind of you know, clearly sort of arrogant, rapacious people who could care less about what the market was about or, you know, I mean, their sole interest was in maximizing their own profits and in lining the pockets of their investors. And and that was clear. I mean, they, you know, they had no, um, they didn't misrepresent themselves as anything but mm -hmm. that, but I think that there was a, a desire on the part of some of the city officials who dealt with them and, and um, uh, you know, some of the PDA leadership to assume that they were good folks and that this was going to be a win-win situation that uh, everybody would come out ahead, head on. And I think it was a mistake. And I thought it was a mistake then. Any other questions? What are you doing now? What am I doing now? Well, I'm uh, happily married. I'm a father of a two-year-old son named Gabe and have another one on the way in about three weeks. I'm head of the um, Grove Arcade Public Market Foundation, which is a um, nonprofit that has taken on the redevelopment of a 269,000 square foot building in downtown Asheville, which was built in the 20s as a public market, and the federal government took it over in 1942 as part of the war effort, kicked out 203 businesses, and we've recently gotten it back from the federal government, have subleased a portion of it to a private developer who's going to use it for um, housing and offices, and we're breaking ground on a new public market development in um, December of this year. Also have consulted to 15 different cities and nonprofits and community development corporations on revitalizing and or creating new public markets really all over the country. I've worked with the Gullah people in between Savannah and Charleston on a new public market project there. I worked with the city of Baltimore on transforming their public market, neighborhood public market system from city ownership to private nonprofit ownership. Of, been the lead consultant on Finley Market and Cincinnati's uh, $15 million um, renovation, did a feasibility study for the public market project in Chattanooga, working on a new public market um, 
uh, Caribbean market in Miami and so forth. What fun. Yeah. All that after we retired from mm -hmm. <laughs> I can't think of anything else on that except for any, uh, on the medical center, any particular stories you recall from the first entered into the overload uh, tavern? The Mudlow Tavern? Uh, I do remember that from time to time when um, doctors were seeing patients in the Mother Lowe Tavern, some biker would pull up and on a Harley Davidson and walk in the door thinking that it was still still a tavern. That, I remember that happening a few times, which was which was pretty interesting. Um, no, I mean I, you know, I mean what I really remember was the this the passion that the the volunteers and elderly folks themselves really brought to creating the space and turning it into a place that really would make a difference in, in the community and would really serve people in the community. And I remember that it, w it was about so much more than just treating people's health problems, that it really was about build, maintaining and building a sense of community. And that, you know, that was really what, what was key. was on that street, on that block? On the, the mother load? Well, I mean, you know, the mother load, of course, is where the, um, the inn at the market is now, and there were storefronts right down that street. I, I, don't, I don't really remember. Yeah, Rogers Clothing. Yeah, that's right. Rogers Clothing was, was a big one. Um, the mother load was in the middle. St. Vinny's was on the other end, I think. That's right. Um, one, other, one other story that, that I remember was the, um, after my initial interview at the, um, at the PDA, I wanted to get a beer and just kind of think about what I wanted to do. It's, it's actually where, where I decided not to uh, accept the job that I was, was offered. Um, and um, I went to the Place Pagal to get a beer, and this was before the, the renovation. And I was sort of sitting off in the corner um, getting a, uh, drinking my beer, and at that point, the Place Pagal was kind of a biker's mm -hmm. bar, and this woman came around asking people to buy her, buy her a beer, and nobody would buy her a beer, and she climbed up on top of the uh, bar at the Place Pagal and took off all of her clothes. And several people bought her a beer, and I thought that you know this is this is an interesting place that I'm thinking about getting involved with. And it's a, it's a little, little. Well, while, while we have you on tape, and who knows when we'll get you again, why don't you also um, talk about why the Market Foundation got started? Sure. And what that took. Sure. Um, well, you know, it really was the same. Uh, you know the. Uh, the genesis of, or the need for the Market Foundation came about from the same place that the supposed need for bringing in the, um, you know, the tax credit investors. Uh, you know, there was a wholesale withdrawal of federal funding from anything that had to do with serving low-income people. And, you know, at that point we had the senior center and the clinic and the food bank and the child care center were already up and running. And, um, you know, there was a panic that, you know, they were largely dependent um, on what amounted to federal funds. And as, you know, Reagan talked about getting rid of the waste and mismanagement um, and, you know, was very, very successful at sort of maintaining all of the waste and mismanagement, but basically getting rid of all of the content, um, you know, any good that any of those federal dollars were doing as, as that money was being withdrawn. And, um, you know, there was a, a real sense of, of fear. And I remember talking with uh, Chris Hurley, who was the um, head of the clinic at the time, about, you know, what are we going to do? And, you know, how, how can this be sustained? And, you know, basically really came up with the idea of tapping into the affection that people felt for the market, the sense of ownership that 
people felt for the market as a vehicle for really sustaining the most threatened part of the market, and yet also the part of the market that contributed the most to its heritage and to its character. And I remember, you know, going around and talking with a number of people, like Jerry Johnson and uh, John Kleiss and, and so forth, about you know, could this work and would this make any sense? And you know, getting a very very positive response. I remember Jerry being incredibly enthusiastic and uh, positive um, uh, about that. And um, you know, committing to having that housed initially within the PDA. At that point, I was one of the directors of the PDA, and um, you know, agreed to take on the initial leadership of, of doing that organization. But there were, again, were lots of Vista volunteers. Lot, you know, Chris was was very involved in the uh, initial conceptualization and organization um, of it. Talk and about Gene Falls and how you fished um, Gene was on the PDA Council, and, you know, Gene was somebody who cared. You know, Gene was somebody who really, um, you know, came from a privileged background herself, but really was very sympathetic to the, uh, you know, a concept of the market that was inclusive rather than exclusive, uh, and understood the importance of the kind of diversity that made the market special and unique. And um, I remember talking with Gene about um, the concept, and Gene was incredibly supportive, and I asked her if she would help lead the effort to uh, put the board of directors together. And um, she agreed to do that and, and you know, did, did a great job. One of the people that I remember talking with uh, along with that was Ilsley Nordstrom. And I remember Ilsley, who was, who was the, the widow of the founder of Nordstrom's department stores, um, I remember Ilsley talking about how she and her husband had really led the effort to tear the market down, and not led, but had been very involved and supportive of the effort to tear the market down, and how that was the worst decision she had ever made, and how how great the market's renovation had been for the community and the downtown, and how great it had been for Nordstrom's, and how supportive she was. And you know, I thought that was a very poignant mo moment in uh, in that effort. Good. Thank you. Good. My brain is now empty. Right, yeah. Thanks. <laughs>